time, we're going to get started. And um, my name is Erin Sanchez. I am with One Dance UK as the Health, Wellbeing and Performance Manager. And um, I'd like to welcome you to this Return to Dance webinar. And um, today we will be, sorry, my apologies. And we will be uh, hosting this webinar uh, on behalf of One Dance UK, which is the sector support organization for dance. We are also the subject association for dance, and we run the dance medicine and science expert panel. Um, we are also representing the National Institute of Dance Medicine and Science, whose role it is to enhance dancers' health, well-being, and performance as a national support sector and there are six partners within the National Institute, Trinity Lab and Conservatoire for Music and Dance, the University of Wolverhampton, the University of Birmingham, Birmingham Royal Ballet, the Royal Ballet and One Dance UK. And I would like to introduce you overall to the Dance Medicine and Science Expert Panel. This is the group of people who are working with One Dance UK to inform our work around dancers health. And today we are welcome, welcoming three of those members of the expert panel to um, discuss returning to dance. Um, our chair this uh, today will be Andrew Hurst, the CEO of One Dance UK. And we also have Nick Allen, PhD from Birmingham Royal Ballet, Professor Emma Redding, PhD from Trinity Laban Conservatoire for Music and Dance, and Kim Hutt from the uh, LCDS, the London Contemporary Dance School. So um, just a brief uh, overview of how this webinar will work. Um, we are going to try to address as many questions as possible live during this session. However, we recognize that it's very possible that we won't be able to address everyone's questions in this time frame. Please remember that we will be able to follow up with you um, in writing for any question that you ask. So, we will be taking note of all the questions that are asked here and we will follow up with everyone in writing in order to answer those questions. If you would like to raise a question during the session, you can use the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of the screen. So if you mouse over your screen, you should see that there is a box at the bottom of the screen that will allow you to enter a question and we will answer those questions at the end of the presentation. Um, you're also very welcome to use the chat box for any discussion that you would like to um, have with any of the participants or the panel members. However, we ask that you please put any questions you'd like answered into the Q&A box. So I'd like now to hand over to Andrew Hurst, our CEO, and he will be uh, taking some of the rest of the session. Thank you, Andrew. So, um, welcome everybody. Um, to the first uh, in a series of online Q&A sessions on returning to dance safely, which are going to be co-hosted by One Dance UK and the Dance Medicine and Science Expert Panel. Um, it's great to see so many familiar names in the participant list, um, but I can see there are lots, lots of new names too, which is fantastic. Um, but I'm going to give you a little bit of background on myself and on One Dance UK before we move on to an overview of government gardens. So I'm Andrew, I'm Chief Executive of One Dance UK. I was a professional dancer for 15 years and I worked as a manager for various dance companies for over 10 years. I was always a company representative in all of the companies I worked in. And even as a manager, I was very focused on keeping dancers safe and healthy. So this topic is very important to me. So a bit of background on One Dance UK, if you're not a member, One Dance UK runs the Healthier Dancer Programme and is a founder partner in the National Institute of Dance Medicine and Science. So providing information and education on dancers' health is central to our mission. Advocacy, political engagement, and lobbying are also hugely important part of what we do at One Dance UK, and it's a massive focus of my work personally. From the very beginning, we've been focused on and very active on the issues that matter most to all of us working in the dance support for freelancers, the impact of education policy on creative subjects, and of course, Brexit, just to name a few. We've built excellent working relationships with government, parliamentarian and civil, civil servants, and are a trusted partner. So what this means is that when policymakers and politicians are considering and discussing 
the issues that affect all of us and the arts more broadly, we have a seat at the table and dance as a voice. And about our work in response to the pandemic, right from the beginning of the pandemic crisis, we've been in regular contact with the government and officials, reporting on the needs of the sector, the shortfalls in support and putting forward solutions. This is to ensure that dance has a voice and remains on the agenda. Over the past few weeks, the focus has shifted towards reopening and whilst lobbying hard on the rescue package for our sector, we've been helping the UK government to develop guidance on return to work for the performing arts. I'll come on to the guidance in, in a bit, but I wanted to reassure you that guidance will enable a lot of dance activity to restart. We were hoping that it might have been published already before this first session, um, but we are expecting an announcement from the UK government today on timing for the reopening of our sector and we hope that DCMS guidance will be published alongside this. Other countries uh, are several weeks, if not months, ahead of us, but there's also quite a lot to be learned internationally and even from sport in this country, which is a good month and a half or so ahead of us. There are still lots of questions that remain unanswered, but a huge amount of progress has been made and I'm confident that we'll all be able to start moving again very soon. Our efforts are very much focused on making sure that it's safe when we are allowed. And that's really at the heart of these sessions that we're running over the coming weeks. We may not have all of the answers to your questions, as Erin said, but we are committed to supporting you to be safe when you return to dance. The science is evolving and we're all learning together, but there's a lot of expert knowledge and experience across a variety of settings on the panel here today. So a bit of background on government guidance. Over the past week or two, several pieces of guidance have been published by various departments of the UK government and also by the Scottish government. Some of this has been confusing or even contradictory at times. And we understand how difficult this can be to navigate, but we're working hard to seek clarification for the dance sector. We're going to try and give you an overview of government guidance today and what it means for you. In general, each sector or industry that's allowed to reopen or return to work has to follow COVID secure guidance to ensure the safety of its workers. There's quite a lot of this guidance which has been published already for various sectors and generally the guidance follows a specific format which provides a framework for risk assessment and management in line with the employer's responsibilities under the Health and Safety at Work Act and it effectively treats COVID-19 as another risk which needs to be managed in the workplace. Hopefully later today, the Prime Minister will make an announcement on the timing for the reopening of the performing arts sector. And we're expecting the DCNS guidance on return to training, rehearsal and performance to be published alongside this. Both Nick, who's on the panel today, and myself have been part of the working group who've been closely involved in the development of the DCMS guidance. Nick has also been involved in developing more detailed guidance for the big ballet companies and the rest of the dance, medicine and science expert panel have been involved in consultation on this DCMS guidance. But nobody has all of the answers. We'll answer as many questions as we can and we'll take away other questions that we don't get to today. Our members work across, uh, all across the UK in a range of different roles and contexts and may have to refer to several different pieces of guidance depending on the context they're working in and where they're working. We're committed to providing practical advice and educational resources to help both individuals and organisations understand how to interpret government guidance and how it applies to each of you in your specific working context. Public health is a devolved issue so timelines are likely to be different in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales and we've seen that already throughout the easing of lockdown and there may be specific restrictions there but the basic principles of managing risk remain the same across different working contexts and should be useful for anyone wanting to return to dance. When we discussed this again yesterday, Dr. Rhoda Warman, who's also on the expert panel, is now working as a contract uh, tracer and will be a panel member on future sessions, suggested that you might consider finding out who your local uh, public health officer is, as they can often be very helpful. 
So Nick now, I think, is going to give a bit of an overview on the virus and symptoms um, before we look a little bit at managing risk and then we take some questions. Thanks, Andrew, uh, and thanks, Erin, for setting all this up. Uh, as Andrew said, uh, we certainly can't sit here and, and, and profess to have all uh, the answers, and there's certainly going to be some questions I'm sure we are, are going to have to defer for a while until we have greater knowledge. Uh, there's a huge amount of work that's actually got into, gone into this to get us to this stage. And as Andrew said, and this is something that we can circulate, is that we actually formed a medical working group that included the independent medical advisor for DCMS. It included consultation with uh, Dr. Jennifer Smith, who's the Deputy Director of Public Health England, and Dr. Justin Barney, who's the Director of Public Health for Birmingham. So we, we worked really hard on trying to establish a robust framework so that organizations and individuals can understand what it is that we're going through with the level of knowledge that we have. Uh, and so what I'll do is I'll touch on a little bit of that as we go through this. But there's a lot of stuff that's out there anyway, and I'm sure a lot of you have uh, you know, a certain degree of understanding, if not more understanding about what coronavirus actually is. Now, the reality is coronavirus isn't new. This is just, the newest strain that we're seeing. And, uh, and I think there's a few things then to consider as part of that. And the, there's a, a real relevance because when we talk about the mitigations that we are going into, there's been lots of chat at the moment, if you look at the media around, well, we're seeing less uh, mortality rates than we would naturally see with flu at the moment. And that's a really positive thing. Flu is also a, a form of coronavirus, but actually, COVID-19 is different and COVID-19 is different because there is about a seven day incubation period. And the importance of that is that we're sitting for seven days, potentially shedding this virus and being highly contagious until we know about it. And so when we talk about these mitigations, it might seem that we're doing over and above what might necessarily be in place for something like a, a flu outbreak. But there is a particular reason for it. We're just, uh, we're just waiting for Nick's phone. Stop Sorry, I've just waited. No, somebody's answered. I, I put the other phone on mute, but I can't put that one on mute. Sorry, I'm one of the people who still have a landline. Go figure. Uh, so... So, that, that, so I think that's really important to understand about this virus is that we've, we've got this seven day incubation period. So, so we do have to be more careful. There are absolute reasons why these measures have been put in place. I think the other thing that we're learning from uh, the testing procedures at the moment is we have a very high percentage of asymptomatic spreaders. So we've listed the key symptoms here, high temperature, a new and continuous cough. The ones that were added more recently is uh, a loss or change of smell and taste. Now those are really, really important, but what we see is a huge, huge percentage that will not have these symptoms at all. And so again, that is why when we talk about social distancing and we talk about all the other things that we're talking in regards to risk mitigation, they are so important that we adhere to them because you know, and I said this in a few meetings, that as an industry, the last thing we want to do is to be responsible for the second wave because we think it doesn't pertain to us. So we can't, we can't eliminate this at all. We're talking about eliminating, uh, we're talking about mitigating risk, not eliminating risk. And so if you have an awareness of these symptoms, it's really important that we, we go through those measures and I'll talk about that in a sec. But the fact that we have asymptomatic cases the fact that we have a seven day incubation period means that we need to be far more vigilant than we would do through a normal flu season. We'll have a look at some of the, uh, uh, we'll have a look at the next slide and we'll talk about what happens then if you do have some of these symptoms coming through. <clears throat> so this is nothing different to what government uh, guidance has been. And I'm sure we've all seen this. It's, it's been uh, well sort of populated across all channels that we can, uh, we can get this information across. But because of the way that this virus and how contagious it is, the idea that you need to actually 
stay at home, don't leave the house at all. So, so those, those abilities to do that, when you're working in organizations and you're actually having your uh, members coming into the building, asking them to be mindful and vigilant when they're waking up in the morning and actually not coming in at all to say, you know, I'm not feeling so great. You know, certainly from my perspective, uh, working in, in Phoenix, the amount of times I've had people in the past who will just come in and go, yeah, I'm really not feeling very well. I don't want you coming into my clinic to tell me that you're not feeling well. Please, please just stay at home. Uh, you can go through the website. You can contact 111. 119 is still working at the moment as well. Uh, and test and trace is an important part, particularly because of how this is going to spread, that we do adhere to that. So all of that's been out in the government uh, guidance, and we absolutely as a sector need to adhere to that as well. I did want to talk about the type of testing that is available at the, in, in, in the UK at the moment and what it means as well. So the antigen testing is the work that's been done around uh, test and trace. And the antigen testing very much looks at what's happening around the respiratory tract cells. So this is a, it's a respiratory virus, and so they can take a swab from, from the inside of your mouth, and we can have a look and see whether or not there is any virus present in those cells. And it is, it is most sensitive around day five, it seems, of picking it up. If you're doing that test before that, you might actually turn around a test uh, that's not positive. If you do it after that, again, you might not turn around a test that's positive. So unfortunately, antigen testing isn't, isn't as robust as maybe we'd like it to be. So one of the things around antigen testing, and if you know with football, they're doing regular antigen testing with all their players in the premiership, and that was part of the deal for them to return back to work. When you're funding that privately, that's about £100 a test. So that being done twice a week because of the sensitivity of tests, you can get into quite an astronomical figure. Very critically, it doesn't allow you for, to return any sooner. So it's an important part of our data collection it's an important part of knowing whether or not you have it, but just because you have a negative test in the presence of symptoms, it doesn't mean that you can return back to work. So you still need to isolate for at least seven days. But we must get people to, to, to undergo the antigen testing as well. The second is the antibody testing. So the antibody testing is a blood test, and that is a way of trying to understand have we developed antibodies as a result of having the coronavirus. What we don't know at this stage is whether or not having had the coronavirus, does it mean that you're actually immune from getting it again? That's an uncertainty at this stage. It doesn't tell us if we are immune for how long. Could it be a month? Could it be three months? It doesn't tell us whether or not if and what typically happens with coronavirus, it mutates slightly. Are we going to be immune to a new mutation? So again, antibody testing may have no direct impact on whether or not we can return back to work straight away. It doesn't give you immunity to say, don't worry about me, I can come back to work because I'm immune. But if you're offered antibody testing, it will, it will enhance our understanding of what's going on with this as a disease process. So if and when those become available and more uh, uh, prevalent in the UK, please do consider where you can play your role in helping us understand this a little bit more. If we look at the next slide, we're talking about managing risks. And again, this is stuff that's gone out there again and again. And there are no simple ways. I would probably have a look around the sort of uh, social distancing as your key thing. So I'm going to kind of go backwards. Social distancing is the most important thing that we're looking at when we're managing risk. So when we've, when we've been talking about this within the various task forces and working groups, uh, one of the things that we know when we talk about the virus and viral load is that it's, it is transmitted. It's a respiratory uh, virus, so it comes through the respiratory tract, and it is transmitted through the small droplets that naturally happen when you breathe. Now, that's important to understand. So when we're talking about exercising in an indoor environment, when your expiration rate is going to be picking up, that becomes relevant for us as a dance sector because we're going to see people do that. The thing about uh, this as a virus at the moment with our current understanding is we, it, it doesn't fly around. It comes out for about two meters and it drops. So when they set up places like the Nightingale Hospital, they could put big perspex screens and allow them to be very well controlled. 
so they could still manage part of the uh, part of the build in the nightingale while still having patients in the same area so when we're talking about mitigating risk the best thing we can do is we can look about social uh, distancing and that's an important thing to consider if you're out and about or even if you're in your studios within our working documents what we've talked about is we talked about doing those risk assessments and those risk assessments fundamentally have social distancing uh, as its foundation so we talk about ensuring that people have adequate uh, timing when they come into the buildings and that they look at the different working environments that people are working from and we talk about what else could we do now particularly within dance we're gonna have areas that are very much common touch points whether or not they be bar whether or not it be through the entrances exits doors panels those sort of things so regular cleaning of our hands is going to make a very big difference as to how this is spread uh, ensuring that we're taking all of those sort of uh, risk mitigations in in place i've just noticed through the chat it was coming up about the two meter distancing in regards to dance there is work that's actually been done at the moment around the aerobiology uh, of COVID-19 to try to enhance our understanding. When you look at what's been released so far from a sporting perspective, it's all been based outdoors. So we're starting to, to go into where the professional environment will be exercising indoors. And we've had to put forward very robust measures in order to reduce that risk. So we are putting extensive measures in place to try to reduce that risk for indoor activity and indoor exercise because there is still so much unknown around it and so we've been expected to do more as this evolves and it does evolve then we will be able to share more of that information as we go along the other thing around managing risk that i did want to mention is this concept of viral load and i suppose one of the best analogies that i've heard around viral load was it was akin to getting sunburn well if you go out and you spend all day in the sun the chances are you're going to get sunburn whereas if you just pop out come back straight away less likely so there are ways of mitigating risk of actually reducing contact time and reducing exposure so when you're trying to manage risk if you do more measures of reducing your exposure to potential viral load you reduce reduce the risk of you actually catching it as well so when you're in those sort of environments rather than being face to face being side by side uh, and all those sort of things are things that you can actually consider doing when trying to consider how to uh, to reduce risk so if we move to the next slide um, nick can i just jump in there sorry yeah so, um, on on that slide is basically they're the main details that appear around managing risk in all of the government guidance so they're they're the basic things that everybody is expected to do to manage the risk of COVID-19. So carry out a risk assessment uh, if you're working with people. And then all of those other things are kind of standard advice uh, across uh, all different sectors. And you'll see that the last point um, recognizes that some, some kinds of work mean that it's not always possible to maintain uh, social distance. Um, and, and when that is the case, there are kind of additional uh, mit mitigation measures that, that can be taken. So it's not saying that it's not possible for people to dance together. It's just saying that um, the best way to manage the risk uh, is to maintain social distance. And when you can't maintain social distance always, then there are a series of kind of extra mitigation measures that need to be put in place. We can go on to the next one. So again, uh, as Edward was saying, is that there are times when you can't necessarily uh, socially distance. And one of the things that the government guidelines will be very clear on is who and what sort of personal protection equipment should be used. Uh, and, and they're very, very simple uh, sort of division between that. So what we were hoping for in the government guidelines is they would talk about clinical PPE versus non-clinical PPE. The way that it's going to come through is probably it's going to say PPE versus face coverings. And very simply, clinical PPE should only be used by 
clinical team. So if you normally would consider working in PPE, then those are the people that should be wearing it. Uh, whereas the use of face covering, that's different. And you'll see the recommendations from the government at the moment as if you're using public transport, that you'll be required to use a face covering. Now, one of the reasons why there's been a little bit of apprehension around using face coverings is because that false sense of security that happens and people might then therefore not adhere to social distancing. We know that social distancing is one of our best ways of mitigating risk. So what we want to do is we want to ensure that people are aware of social distancing as the key mitigating factors. But with so much unknown in and around transmission indoors with exercising individuals, we've had this discussion with the medical working groups and the other task forces. And certainly our position as it stands at the moment is that we would be strongly encouraging with uh, our professional dancers returning back to the studios last week, this week, uh, and in the coming weeks for some companies, that we, we strongly advocate the use of a face covering whilst in the studios, just as an additional measure to reduce risk. So if you're in the environment where you're seeing exercising individuals, high expiration rates, uh, ventilation makes a very big difference around uh, risk mitigation, but we are indoors, that's not always possible then you may want to consider face coverings. But I think it's worth knowing that if you have medical teams within, uh, within the organizations that you work or you, or you see a, a physio or a doc privately, they will actually have the uh, uh, PPE in place because that is our guidelines. All clinical staff are expected to, uh, to have those. Should we move on to the next slide? So I think Andrew. this is me again, yeah. So just um, a, a little bit more detail about social distancing and how uh, it's expected to work and what we're expecting to see in the performing arts guidance. So um, overall, the main objective is to maintain social distancing whenever possible, because as we've already said, that's the, the best way to kind of manage the risk and to keep people safe. Um, there are a number of points there which we're expecting to see in the guidance which are about kind of logistics about limiting the number of people in space about arriving to buildings and the way people move around buildings um, and these these again are things that are common across um, guidance for a, a number of different sectors um, so there are these are the kind of things that you would need to consider um, in a kind of performing arts environment but as I said, I think on the next slide, um, it also recognises that um, it's not always possible to maintain social distance for certain kinds of work. And when that's the case, um, you need to take uh, other mitigating actions to reduce the risk of transmission as much as possible. So they're the, they're the things that are, are described so increasing hand washing and cleaning and uh, keeping that activity where social distance is not uh, maintained uh, as short as possible so that um, people aren't exposed in that way um, for long periods of time. And then other things that Nick's already mentioned, so back to back or side to side, to side rather than face to face. Um, and the key thing, the key mitigation measure around um, the managing risk is the use of fixed groups or bubbles that people have probably heard about. So um, if, you, if you have people that are working together regularly, they effectively are a fixed group. Um, and if you keep them in that group and they don't switch between other groups, then that's a way of kind of uh, managing um, any potential spread. So if one person in that fixed group or bubble um, were to have symptoms, then just that fixed group um, would have to isolate, not the whole building, the whole organisation. Um, but it's very important to consider um, that there is no swapping allowed between fixed groups. A fixed group is a fixed group by definition. Um, and if you have, for example, a teacher or a choreographer who's working with a number of, of fixed groups, then they need to maintain a distance. Um, because uh, otherwise they're breaking the fixed group. 
Um, so there are, these are things that need to be considered. Are there things that um, uh, should enable it to be possible for dancers to, to work more closely together if they're part of a fixed group and those other kind of mitigation measures are used? I think now they're the key points that we wanted to cover. Um, so we can probably move to uh, addressing some of the questions. There's a slide, there's a slide there which is about the next sessions, which is fine, you can leave that if you want, Erin. Um, the first question in the Q&A box, so just a reminder that we've seen some questions popping up in the chat. Um, it's going to work better if you put them in the Q&A um, because then we can scoop them all up. We'll try and answer the ones that we can. Um, so the first one is about um, air foot ventilation and air filtration systems. And Nick has said that he's going to have a go at answering that. Did I? I'm not sure I did. Yeah, so air filtration systems are, are interesting because obviously what we're talking about here is we're talking about circulating air. So what we know and what we have with the evidence so far is that we are trying to see as much natural ventilation as possible. It's not ideal, but if you can open your studio windows, if you have some, get them open. There is more research being done at the moment as to whether or not that is circulating the, uh, the virus at the moment. But the reality is what we understand about this virus and the aerobiology is it doesn't fly around in the air. So most air filtration systems aren't necessarily going to add any advantage. Most air conditioning systems aren't necessarily going to spread it. But that is part of the evolving science. So the government guidelines at this stage is to try to improve ventilation as much as possible. So where you can, open your windows. Great, thanks Nick. Um, so the next question from Matthew is, uh, will the guidance due to be published apply to England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland? Um, no, it doesn't. So the, although it should be useful for anybody working in those kind of contexts, um, it very explicitly says that a public health is a devolved issue um, and that's why we've seen um, different approaches to the relaxing of lockdown uh, across the devolved nations um, so it, it isn't uh, it doesn't apply to the other nations but it should still be very useful for anyone working in the performing arts as I said earlier basically what it lays out is a kind of framework for um, the, the assessment and management of risk um, we are talking to uh, the devolved governments and um, we've got a round table tomorrow with the health secretary in Scotland and um, we're also uh, working with other sector bodies in Northern Ireland and Wales um, but we do very much hope that um, this DCMS the performing arts balance will still be useful and um, even though you may be working to a slightly different timeline in uh, Scotland, Northern Ireland or Wales. Um, the next question is from Louise um, um, and it's about, so she says, I'm a teacher with no studio space of my own. Uh, so I hire facilities from secondary schools and social clubs. Uh, when they eventually let me back in, who is responsible for deep cleaning? Me, the venue owner or both? So um, this performing arts guidance does recognize the fact that um, a lot of activity happens in third party buildings. Um, there is effectively a kind of joint responsibility, although if you're hiring a venue, they should be able to provide you with their own risk assessment, COVID-19 risk assessment, you should know what they have done and put in place. Um, they, they have to be able to provide uh, that for you. Um, and they, they will be directed to um, do a deep clean of any, any space before it's reopened. Um, so what you will need to think about, you need to check that that has happened and you'll need to think about um, changeover within that space so um, if I were you I'd, I'd want to check that it's been thoroughly cleaned before you step into the space before you, you let people into the space but you also want to think about if you're having different groups um, you need to allow sufficient time within, between different groups um, for cleaning and also to air out the space. Uh, the next question was uh, in reference to something you said, Nick, is, um, is that day five of showing coronavirus symptoms? Are yeah, so I, 
I presume that's to do with the antigen testing. Yeah. So, so even though you're showing symptoms, it may be up to day five before you actually turn, return a positive test. Uh, so even if you have a negative test, I'm afraid it doesn't say that you don't have coronavirus. Thanks, Nick. Um, Helen's got a question. Can you please clarify what is the breathing impact that is in the government guidelines? Does this refer to card cardiovascular activity? Will this impact on the level of activity that will be allowed? So um, I'll give a bit of a view and then I'll let Nick answer this one too. Um, so there isn't anything about breathing specifically. Um, the one uh, complication, the reason this formula arts guidance has taken so long to be published is because there are um, much more strict um, uh, restrictions on singing and on the use of uh, uh, brass and wind instruments um, because of some of the science and some of the public health concerns about um, uh, droplets being spread um, through that activity. Um, they, we've asked this question very early on from about dancers and um, it hasn't appeared to have been of such concern to the, to the medics and public health um, officials, but Nick probably has a more detailed answer on, on breathing. And yeah, so, so again, so we've, we've worked uh, very much with uh, Jennifer Smith, who's the Deputy Director of Public Health England around this, uh, and we've been working very closely with our colleagues in professional sports, particularly some of those sports that have uh, more sort of contact area so you'll notice that non-contact sports like football have come back but rugby is still on its way because of trying to understand what happens with the exercise in individual so we've got a few questions all around you know can it spread so what it refers to is obviously you have a greater expiration rate when you're kind of cardiovascularly more challenged and as such is there a chance that it's going to ex you know is, is it going to expel even further as Andrew said, that they have commissioned research into the aerobiology of coronavirus, particularly because of the enunciation that's seen with actors, with the expiration, uh, with our choral singers, and what happens with wind and brass. So there will be more information uh, coming through. But at this stage, we've been told that those risks don't exist. We did talk about, and I'm looking at the question below, do we need to social distance further than two meters? The guidelines are likely to suggest with wind and brass and singing that those social distances are extended uh, and it's, it's extended quite significantly with singing, less so with wind and brass. Uh, we're waiting for final confirmations of those, so we won't answer that until we absolutely know, but with our social distancing, uh, we are gonna be sticking with the two meters what we've done with our own local guidelines is we've suggested that the more you can social distance, the lower the risk. Again, this is risk mitigation, it's not elimination. So the, the more distance you can spread between them, the more uh, space you have, the less it's going to be. I did want to make one point, I know it's a question that I think I saw posted prior to this start and I have been asked it by a few companies, is this is a respiratory virus and so it's when you expel your air it doesn't and it isn't transmitted in sweat so it doesn't relate to the water droplets that you have on your body when you're sweating other than you're probably having some common touch points themselves uh, and that's just because you're working hard so don't worry too much about that could i jump in and say something quickly um just based on our experience at london contemporary dance school we've started with some floor markings in our studios um, and currently we started with some quite large floor markings to allow for more social distancing but we are hoping to reduce that so that we will have a minimum of two meters by two meters um, between each person in the studio um, but when we're working with that level of social distancing we will be keeping the intensities of our classes quite low to ensure that there's um, less aerosols being produced by the dancers. And then when the classes are gonna be designed to be slightly more intense, we'll probably increase social distancing just to keep things safe. Brilliant, thanks, thanks Kim. So I think we've sort of rolled together quite a few questions there. It's about breathing, um, about droplets being expelled further, and about um, physical activity such as dance increasing the spread. At the moment, there isn't any evidence for that. So um, 
two meters is considered to be safe. Um, more more distance is even safer, if you like. And the next question is um, about self, being self-employed and risk assessments. And um, so again, in the performing arts guidance, it recognizes that um, there are lots of people working freelance who are self-employed and um, that uh, in individuals who are freelance or self-employed do have a responsibility to carry out risk assessments as you did before. So you need to consider this risk, uh, the risk of COVID-19 as part of your risk assessment. Um, but if you're going into somebody else's space, they also have a responsibility to carry out a risk assessment for their space. So again, as I said before, you should be asking to see their own risk assessment, but you need to carry out your own, own risk assessment. The guidance actually mentions that um, for somebody who's self-employed or, or only working with a small number of people, that um, uh, this doesn't necessarily need to be um, written down, but you do need to prove that you've carried out a risk assessment in order to be covered by uh, insurance. Um, we are actually looking at, um, there are some generic templates, um, but we've also been looking at um, a risk assessment template that's been put together by the by BAPAM, which is Association of Performing Arts Medicine, um, which might be quite helpful for people. So, um, yes, you will need to carry out your own uh, risk assessment as, as a freelancer or somebody who's self-employed. Um, and you need to think about, um, I, if I were you, I would be providing hand sanitizer. You need to talk to this, the people in the space that you're using about cleaning, toilet cleaning, and the rest of it. Um, you will want to see their risk assessments. Um, and you need to make sure that you feel it's safe uh, to bring people into that space. Um, so the next question about surface hygiene. It'd be great to have recommendations around footwork in contemporary dance. So there is, um, I think we might even have a slide on uh, cleaning. Uh, there is something that we're expecting to see in the guidance um, about cleaning. Uh, of services. Um, Nick, do you want to say anything about, about that that's come up? Uh, just because if you look, there's three questions that all sort of sit in and around that same sort of space around uh, more risky activities. This is around recognising in your risk assessments common touch points, be it feet on the floor, be it all bodies on the floor, be it the bar where you're just kind of doing uh, first stages of class. And whatever those common touch points are, you want to mitigate risk by having regular cleaning. And that's, that would be the way to do it. Yeah, so um, what we've seen uh, elsewhere in other countries is um, uh, a kind of requirement for deep cleaning between uh, uh, the use of the same space by different uh, groups. So that isn't prescribed in, uh, in this performing arts guidance, um, but it would be a sensible thing to think about if you have, um, if it's the same group working in the same space all day long, then obviously that, that's fine. If you're bringing another group into the same space, then really you want to make sure it's cleaned uh, in between and you want to think about those contact points um, as Nick uh, outlined. Uh, and perhaps to add to that, in terms of bare feet, there is a question of bare feet. Um, it might, if, if there's no cleaning of the floors between bubbles of people or between classes, it, it might just mitigate the risk a little to keep socks on in those classes. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> um, so there's a question from Nicola about uh, there being an assumption that various activities are more high risk, temporary gymnastics, more time spent on the door. Uh, and uh, Nick, it looks like you said you're going to answer this. So. Well, it, it, it just goes back to the same point. Yes, there absolutely will be, you know, if you've got, you know, there's chances are if you've got higher uh, expiration rates, if you've got more contact points, uh, they are going to be more at risk, so you want to consider more mitigations. Thanks, Nick. Uh, next one is from Millie. She's head of dance at secondary school. Can dancers be in bare feet? I think we've kind of covered that. Yes, they can. You'd want to think about cleaning, cleaning the floor between different groups using the same space. Um, the next one is working in high schools as a separate job. Am I limited to the number of children I can work with? I'm going to three schools potentially every week. Run, teach, dance, three venues, all different children. 
my main employer suggests I may have to choose which job I do as presumably I'm at risk. Okay, so there are a number of different things that come into play here. So there is um, there is some guidance on out of school activities. So that's after school uh, clubs and uh, summer clubs, um, which uh, suggests that um, uh, dance uh, is going to be allowed as part of that, um, but talks about um, maximum group sizes. So yes, limiting the size um, uh, of the class, the number of children you work with. And then you're talking about going to three, three schools um, potentially every week. So that's the kind of, um, what did you call it? Uh, that's the, the spreader kind of scenario. Um, so uh, the way to manage the risk there is by keeping distance, keep, uh, keeping social distance uh, from the groups that are working. So the group is effectively a fixed group and you are, are to kind of stay um, distant from them uh, because if you come into close contact with them um, potentially there's a transmission risk and if you're then moving to another fixed group um, there's there's a risk there. I don't know if um, Emma or Kim wants to say anything about thinking in conservatoires or the schools about teachers working with different groups. Yeah I mean thanks Andrew yeah I've just been manically trying to respond to lots of um, questions um, there's so many and but lots that are quite similar so I think we could put out some guidelines that address a lot of uh, groups of questions but yeah I mean just in terms of how we're trying to apply the guidance and manage risk at Trinity Lab and we will have students in bubbles that will come so in groups of 12 to 15 per studio and that's simply because of the space of our studio so lots of questions on how many students should be in a bubble I think it really depends on on the your studio space size so we're having two meter distance between students measured from sternum to sternum and um, and for our studios that means 12 to 15 people so they come into the building they stay in their group they stay in the same studio and they have a couple of classes and then they leave and that's when we clean the studio um, but our teachers will be moving from bubble to bubble so they won't stay with the same group they will be teaching across and that's um, we've got quite a few questions come up about that so that's why it's really important for our teachers to socially distance um, and so we've got some guidelines on you know not touching students and not getting too close because they'll be moving from bubble to bubble just to protect themselves and the, the rest of the the groups as well um, yeah I could go on Andrew but maybe maybe um, maybe Kim might want to say something else I've got lots I could share about what we're doing if that's helpful but Kim did you have anything to add um, just one little thing one of the other things that we've considered if there's a teacher that's moving from bubble to bubble is um, face away from the students so this is a lot easier obviously if you've got a mirror because the students can see your reflection in the mirror and it looks like you're all doing it together um, but if you have less space then that's that's certainly one additional consideration Lovely, thank you very much. Um, so there's a question which I think Nick is going to answer about the virus potentially being airborne. Yeah, I presume that refers to the open letter uh, that was sent to the World Health Organization. Uh, and, and it is an open letter. It's not based on evidence at this stage, but you know, welcome to an evolving science. There is still so, so much unknown, which is why we're talking about risk mitigation in, in a way that we're trying to appreciate where there are possibly gaps in our knowledge and our understanding. I think that one of the things that uh, I reflect back on, and it was, it was around the construction of the Nightingale in London, is that when they first opened the Nightingale, they had their first 500 uh, beds available, yet they were still building the one and a half thousand that still needed to be built. And what they did was they just had a Perspex screen that was put up so that the workmen were working on one side of a COVID ward where they had patients in the other side and they didn't have a single infection uh, transmitted across. So that would certainly suggest that if you've got a barrier, it doesn't just float around and fly around in the air. But again, that is anecdotal for what they had to do at a time that the crisis was at its worst. So this is an evolving science, it will continue to evolve. The measures that we're talking about that's why we're suggesting that we would strongly support the use of face masks in studios until such time as we're absolutely certain that it's not flying around further than the two meters that have been suggested at this stage then go on you know and there's some questions lower down and i'll just pick those while we're here because we're talking about face masks some questions have been asked about asthmatics and will that be a hindrance 
we're not talking about this being an ideal situation. And if you have somebody who is struggling with shortness of breath, and that is one of the symptoms of COVID-19, by the way. No, if you've got an asthmatic patient who is struggling with that, then it might not be the right time for them to be doing this sort of exercise in this sort of environment because you don't want to expose them to increased risk of respiratory distress because they're having to wear a mask, but you don't want to, you know, an asthmatic patient getting COVID-19 would be an absolute disaster as well. So we are talking about this is not an optimal environment. And so when you do your risk assessments and there are templates that we've attached to our document where we do individual risk assessments, and if there is clinical vulnerability, we say that they should not be working. And in this environment, they should possibly not be taking indoor classes uh, in an environment that may be slightly increased risk of uh, COVID spreading. Thanks, Nick. We kind of picked up quite a few of the questions further down there. That's great. Um, it's also I, learned, I learned that from DCMS. You just pick up a whole bunch of questions. <laughs> Sorry, that's a private joke with Andrew and I. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, yeah, there's a couple of questions on air conditioning as well. and then, uh, We sort of touched on ventilation, but um, Nick, is there anything more you want to say about air conditioning? No, nothing more than, you know, it, again, it's, it's one of those evolving sciences. It's one of those questions. Uh, we know that the disease has obviously been spread around uh, hospitals as well, but you'd expect with the viral load that's been the case. But we asked that very specific question very early on in our, in our the development of the strategy. And considering the amount of viral load in a hospital, the amount of spreading that it was would certainly support the fact that the air conditioning units in hospitals that were running at the time were not responsible for spreading it around. Great, thanks Nick. Um, so there's still a couple of questions uh, about bare feet. I think we've answered them. Erin said she was gonna answer one. Is there anything you wanted to add Erin or should we continue? No, I think you've covered it. Okay, great. Uh, Hey, sorry, Andrew, maybe I just say I'm, I'm in contact with a couple of schools in France who have said that they are insisting on socks for bear, for um, any contemporary work. Now, obviously, that comes with its own risk, because if the, if the floor is quite slippery and you've got young people with socks on. So, you do, you know, we need to sort of, I suppose, apply some common sense as well. And um, maybe socks. At, I, I, don't, I, I don't know what we're doing, actually, at Trinity Laban with regards to socks. But um, and there were a couple of questions about what type of classes are going to be. Um, allowed so whether they're more upright movement material sort of sessions like, rather than so we're doing more ballet and Cunningham for example in term one and less release and floor work so they will be more upright um, but the socks issue I'm not sure I just know that um, some schools are are insisting on socks and maybe just to say also there were some questions about pas de deux work and duet work and touch so we're delaying our performance work and our contact improvisation and our our duo work until january and so term one for us is going to be really focused on training um as opposed to sort of contact improvisation or performance is that the same with you kim uh, yeah, absolutely. And also going back to your point about the types of class, we will be introducing improvisation and floor work classes, um, but we are in a fortunate position to be able to fully clean the floors between our, our fixed groups. So I think it's, it's just balancing up the, um, the risk there, really. Thank you. Um, so there's a question about difference in guidance between professional dance uh, participatory dance, dance education, dance in the community, uh, and that the person wasn't aware that dance companies have been given green light to return to the studio. So this is one of the things that we're very much hoping is gonna be clarified this week. Um, some of you might have seen that there was a kind of surprise announcement by the culture secretary uh, a week ago, um, uh, saying that they had developed a five stage roadmap for reopening the performing arts. Um, it hasn't been published on any government we uh, website. We have been asked uh, numerous questions from how many people about this. Um, it's been suggested that uh, stages one and two are already possible, and that is basically um, training and rehearsals and uh, performances behind closed doors for recording or broadcast purposes. Um, and uh, when, when the announcement is made, hopefully today, we'll have a bit more clarity on that roadmap and the timeline and what is allowed when um, that we are at stage two now and when we move to stage three and stage four. 
So there isn't any, there isn't a lot of clarity on that at the moment, but it is something that we've been pushing very hard on, and we hope that there'll be some clarity um, after the announcement today. Um, gloves is PPE. It's a question. Any thoughts on that, Nick? Yeah, so again, the, the government guidelines will talk about PPE in the clinical environment, so that would include gloves. Uh, you know, any sort of common touch points, you'd be looking to wipe them down anyway. So uh, there's, there's probably little strength around using gloves unless you've got uh, a particularly increased risk of a, of a COVID patient, which is why clinical environments would be required to use them. Other than that, I think if you've got uh, wipe downs and antibacterial and regular hand washing, that shouldn't be a risk. Thank you. Um, so there's a question about fixed groups and youth dance companies. And in, in principle, it's the, same, it's the same thing. Yes, I suppose if you have children inside the school, um, we understand that they're going to be kept in fixed groups. And potentially they could be part of a different fixed group. Um, for an activity outside of school um, yeah that's that's one of the kind of conflicting things but um, in theory uh, you should be thinking about uh, all the same things so uh, maintaining social distancing wherever possible and when that's not possible then it should only be with a fixed group uh, some more questions about bare feet uh, some more about air conditioning um, Recommendations for dance teachers at secondary schools can, uh, about using masks. So I think we've covered face coverings already. There isn't anything specific in the guidance um, requiring people to use them. It just uh, talks about the differentiation between uh, PPE and face coverings. Uh, siblings that will be in different fixed groups. Yeah, that's... Um, that's a, a peculiarity, I suppose. It's uh, it's very possible, um, but again, the reason they're putting the, the control measures in place are for uh, the school environment and the same for the work environments. And people still need to think about uh, what happens outside of those environments at home uh, and uh, try to to stay safe. How much that is having, sorry, Nick, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, so that's one of the areas that obviously within the professional companies, we're talking about fixed groups and we're basing those on artistic need. But we've got, you know, various households that won't dance together artistically, but live together. So the, the value of your fixed group is so that you don't have to isolate a, a larger group of people in order to, uh, to contain an outspread if you do get a break, uh, an outbreak of COVID-19. So we asked for clarification on what would happen in that fixed group scenario is if you had a dancer in one fixed group who uh, maybe developed symptoms and what would happen to their housemate or their partner in their house and to their, if they were in a different fixed group. Now the advice that we were given was that if, uh, if that dancer was symptomatic, the rest of that fixed group would need to isolate if they lived with a partner, that partner would need to isolate, but the fixed group that the partner was in would not need to isolate at this stage unless they developed symptoms themselves. So you could trail it all the way through and you could eventually isolate your entire company, but this is not about eliminations around mitigation. And so you might find that you wanna make a judgment call. You could talk to your local public health officer about how far do you take your isolation to try to protect yourselves. But that is the advice that we had coming back because it was one of our specific questions. Thank you, Nick. Um, I was just trying to scan through the rest of the questions. Lots of them are very similar. There, there, is, there is one about uh, working outdoors and how much safer is it outdoors. Um, Nick, do you want to say something about that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely outdoors because of the ventilation, because of the fact that you could probably use more space. It's definitely going to be safer. You know, I can tell you from BRB's perspective, we are having a policy when we bring them back into the studios is come in, dance, get out. Uh, and then we're going to be running uh, sort of complimentary fitness sessions in a local park. So we're going to take them out into the open air and do our CV sessions and our core sessions and stuff like that in a completely different environment to try and mitigate and reduce risk. Lovely, thank you, Nick. I, I think we've already gone over time. Uh, I know that there are, are lots of questions that we haven't got to. 
um, but we will be kind of collating them. Lots of them appear to be on the same kind of themes. And what we plan to do for the next sessions is to kind of draw out themes from the questions that we've had today and that we've received separately. So the next sessions will be themed around a specific uh, context or aspect of the dance sector. Erin, um, anything else you want to add? Um, just to thank everyone for, for attending the session. I recognize that there are tons and tons of questions, but please be, um, be assured that we will come back to you with answers to those questions. We'll be creating a, um, a written document that brings together the common questions and provides answers to them. Those will be made, made available publicly. The recording of this session will also be made available um, publicly. And finally, the, um, the information as it develops in terms of the release of the guidance will be shared with all of you. And um, the, the information will all be shared on one.ck's website and email to everyone um, following this session. So thank you all so much for your time. Um, the next session in this series will be next Wednesday from 1 to 2 p.m. And then the following session will be next Friday from 1 to 2 p.m. And we will email you about both of those so that you have the uh, information to register if you're interested. So yes, that's all from me. Thanks very much. I think we've got a last uh, slide or two to leave you with, just a reminder of those um, next sessions. And yeah, <laughs> huge thank you to the, to the panel members um, and thank you to all of you for joining. Um, I think as we said at the beginning, this is a kind of learning process for all of us. Um, these questions that, uh, that we get from you really help us um, to know uh, where, the, where we need to focus our work still and where we need to get answers for you. But we are committed to kind of collecting them together and getting you answers um, on them uh, as quickly as we can. So thank you all for joining us. Huge thanks again to the panel members, uh, some of whom you'll see on the future um, sessions and uh, we'll have other members of the expert panel joining other sessions too. So thanks very much everybody and see you soon. Keep safe everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you.